Hello and welcome to Peak Guru's channel. I'm your host, Sri Iyer. Today, I have for the first time, uh, Mr. Sanjay Jha of Congress. Sanjay, welcome to Peak Guru's channel. Thank you very much for inviting me, Sri. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. So, Sanjay, um, you know, what is your current status uh, in the Congress party? Are you in looking out or in staying in or are you a jilted lover? What exactly is your status in the party today? And before you answer, I just want to take one second to explain to our viewers. Viewers, we will try and include your questions, but we think that we have so much material to cover today that we may not be able to include all your questions. Do send your questions in. We will try our best to include them. But Sanjay and I have a lot of stuff to go over. So over to you, Sanjay. Well, you know, I just want to tell all the viewers, uh, thank you very much for logging in. And I will try and keep my answers brief, Shri, so that you are able to ask me as many questions as you wish. And the viewers can pitch in as well. But what's my status? You know, I do think I'm wedded to the ideology of the Congress party. But I may be like uh, a live-in partner who's been told you're not invited to the dining room. <laughs> so it's a couch-based existence. <laughs> well, well, you know, basically I got to do the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> that and you get to do the dishes. So now you, you've uh, you've expressed some displeasure about the way the party was functioning, that you wanted to have some metrics that people could try and measure up to. And uh, th these are all things that perhaps come from your background in a previous life where you were a banker, a very successful one at that. Perhaps just walk us through a little bit about your previous uh, life things and then what prompted you to join the Congress party? Well, in short, if you're asking me for my biography, quick one. Uh, my father was, you know, one of those old fashioned London School of Economics guys. So when I was, you know, graduating from Ferguson College in Pune, my conversation with him used to be on cooperative movement, the Amul story of what is Korean. And, you know, generally he only talked public finance and international economics. So I really got hooked in. So I did my master's in economics, actually. And then I wanted to do a PhD. Unfortunately, I missed my first class by maybe two or three marks. And therefore, I did not qualify at that point of time to get a PhD scholarship in, in the US. You had, a, you had to get a minimum first class. So I went to do an MBA after that from XLRI Jamshedpur. And then I joined ANZ Grindley's Bank. First, it was Grindley's, the good old conservative dada of British banking, which meant you know, a lot of long lunches, a lot of schmoozing of the customers. The bottom line of revenue could wait for a while. And uh, so, <laughs> but it was taken over later on by ANZ. Then I moved to Bank of America, California headquartered bank. I worked there for around two and a half years. And then I joined the US-based mutual fund investment management company called Alliance Capital. Um, based again, they, they made an entry into India after Morgan Stanley. And then after that, I moved to Trade Needle of Britain, part of the British American tobacco, and we set up their mutual fund in India. And after a point, to be honest, Shri, I got pretty bored. So I launched this portal called cricketnext.com, which now has been taken over by Mukesh Ambani's group, Reliance, and is part of the CNN network. And in 2004, uh, because I loved the whole idea that India needed a lot of soft skills, soft power focus, uh, one got into an alliance with the America, actually, again, New York-based company called Dale Carnegie. And we started a soft skills training company in India. That's my professional, shall we say, experience in short. Now, um, you were one of the more nuanced nuanced voices uh, for the Congress party whenever you were on a debate. I mean, I've, I've watched a lot of debates where the Congress party either tries to bluster its way out or try to talk over somebody else instead of making nuanced observations. And you were not that kind of person. You were really a thinker. You made people to still listen to the thing. And sometimes you were on a very, you know, the, the debate was so badly drafted that you knew you were going to be on the lo losing side even before you started. So in my opinion, the Congress party is either stifling your voice or they don't want to listen to you. I mean, you could be somebody like the Yashwan Sena or the Shatrugan Sena of BJP, where they, they kind of got sulked and they, they got pushed out into a corner. But you know, you are not someone that you, you I don't see you as a person who's going to you know be silent. 
and make your uh, dissent noted that way. You've always been somebody who expresses your mind. So um, how do you see yourself in the party today, in the Congress party? You know, Sri, to be honest, I found it ridiculous that we are all adults, right? I mean, people in politics, whether you're a young guy or whatever, you're adults. I mean, for us to be talking about being a part of the grand old party of India and where people are apprehensive or paranoid about speaking the truth just because somebody's not going to like it, I found that to be extremely outrageous, very bizarre. Uh, ultimately, if India is going to be a great democracy, its political parties need to have a very vibrant inner democratic culture. So therefore, I was, frankly, when I wrote those op-eds in the Times of India that led to all the halabulu, uh, why did I write those op-eds in the Times of India, which are, by the way, very constructive suggestions to the Congress party. And I stand by it. In fact, it's still as a pinned tweet on my Twitter profile. The reason I did so was because I was extremely dejected, disappointed that after losing two elections in a thorough decimation at the hands of the BJP, the Congress had not even once sat together collectively and debated as to what went wrong. Now, you know, see, there are many people I'm sure on the program who work with companies and hedge funds and investment banks and whatever you, you do realize that you are evaluated on a quarter to quarter basis. You have to deliver on your whatever shareholder expectation at extraordinary you know, moments of time whenever you are questioned. Here, we were talking about the Congress party, which has led the country for 55 of the 73 years, getting 44 and 52 seats in the Lok Sabha, and not doing that chintan betak, you know, which we use in India, to actually introspect as to where did you go wrong? I mean, obviously, you can't say that the, you can't blame the public, you can't blame the media, you can't blame the EVM, you can't say that, you know, Mr. Modi hoodwinked the people. I mean, we got to respect the public verdict. So if you don't know what your fault lines are, how are you going to get right? And that's the reason why I wrote those pieces. So my short answer to you, Shri, is that I, a lot of people now call me a rebel within the system, but I believe that many of us who are now called the G23 are the true democratic conscience of this party. Um, uh, you, you actually segued me into my next question for you. Mm -hmm. um, there are some party leaders have said, very senior leaders have said, that they have, it has taken them years to get just an audience with the Gandhis. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll give, give one uh, a mention of a person who was on uh, our channel, Mr. Tom Madakan said that. And he is, I mean, he's again very nuanced. He was also a spokesperson for the party, very nuanced. He will never, you know, uh, shout down somebody else. He was always a very, you know, pleasant person that you could talk to and share ideas with. And he said, expressed that, you know, it's very difficult to, you know, even get to see them. Why is it that these two, the family has placed themselves in an ivory tower? Are they a hubris? Is it hubris the reason? Or two, they are afraid of someone showing them the mirror? Well, you know, you mentioned Tom. Tom has been one of the most seasoned Congress veterans in the past. I remember watching him on television when I was, you know, just about getting into the Congress party a little before the 2004 Lok Sabha elections. And, and you know, you could not probably find a more committed fighter like Tom. So obviously, you know, th this is a worrying sign for the Congress. They, one cannot and should not deny it. When people who have fought for you and stood by you through the most difficult times, uh, you need to kind of understand that they come with a certain fiber. Uh, they have a fighting spirit. They are there for the longer haul. And and frankly, Sri, end of day, this is the worry for the Congress, as you rightly mentioned. I, I would say it's not so much political arrogance as much as it is, you know, choosing to frankly delude yourself. Uh, you know, arrogance can can only come when you are actually remarkably successful. If somebody in the Congress has got hubris today, I think they really got a serious problem. The truth is, like an ostrich, you bury your head in the sand. If you do it willingly, frankly, it's political harakiri. Where the Congress at the moment is going wrong, Shri, is not listening to the voices within. Because India is a big, complex country. It's got 135, 136 crore people. The only way you're going to hear them is when you empower your own teams to go out there and get the messages from them back to you. 
And let me point out one thing that I have learned in my life, it's especially in my corporate career. But a boss once told me, always be surrounded by people who give you the bad news first. And therefore, I became the harbinger of, you know, the red flag to the Congress party when I wrote those op-eds. Uh, I got suspended, so be it. But at least I'm glad that I spoke out my conscience. See, um, this this whole concept of, you know, um, a family-owned concern is not new. I'm talking about the Gandhi family. Uh, in the 90s, uh, there used to be stickers, car stickers in the United States. Uh, they used to have the sticker called Bush and Sons, formerly known as the United States of America. This came up when the second Bush got elected and, and one of his brothers was the governor of Florida. I mean, they said, yeah. oh my God, this dynasty is taking over. And, and guess what happened? I mean, Jim Bush couldn't even cross the line in 2016. And he got really hammered for no mistake of his, in my opinion, of the three Bushes. He perhaps was the most suited to be the president of the country. But this is just my opinion. So what made you go and join this family company? Why did you not choose or look at BJP when you decided to take the plunge into politics? I'm just trying to get into the mind of somebody who's being very nuanced. You've made a lot of decisions. You've put in a lot of uh, thought process into this decision of yours. Well, Sri, frankly, I have always felt that the beauty of India is this extraordinary diversity. The fact that India can exist in its you know, multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious character in, in such extraordinary serenity is, is, is by itself a fairy tale. Now, when I was growing up, and I'm glad you asked me this question, uh, my father used to give me, he was a professor, so he used to give me books on my birthday. I used to look forward to some car and some phantom and mandrake and stuff, which were comics. In our time, it was super hits. And, and he would come and you know not buy me an Archie comic, he would give me a book. So I grew up reading Mahatma Gandhi's My Experiments with Truth. I grew up reading Jawala Nehru's Discovery of India. So I got greatly influenced by the Congress leaders who fought during the freedom struggle. My mother, for example, uh, you know, she came from a village in Bihar in Madhubani and Darbhanga district, where she had at that point of time, I don't know when exactly, actually encountered Pandit Nehru. So, you know, the conversation at the home was entirely about the Congress, the freedom struggle, blah, blah. And as you know, that until 1977, the Congress really had not lost elections. I mean, it had lost power in states in 1967. The emergency had happened, but it continued to remain the big centrifugal force of Indian politics. So I was, uh, I'm a 61 born. So I was obviously greatly influenced and saw only the Congress at that point of time. And therefore, for me, logically, uh, I was I was completely influenced, convinced that despite the fault lines or the fact that the Congress had problems, in fact, the Congress began to degenerate in the 70s itself. Later on, of course, I mean, there have been, you know, extremely grave problems that we have confronted ourselves with. But the truth is that I grew up in that ideological space. And that's the reason why, uh, you know, even today, after being suspended from the Congress party, I, I continue to define myself as a Congressy by DNA. I do believe that both the Congress and the BJP, because the BJP is now a formidable force in India, and deservingly so, because I do believe that one of the reasons why the Congress floundered was because of what you asked me, the whole hubris and arrogance. And I do feel that now the Bharatiya Janata Party and the Congress provide India with two ideological and a great number of ways also different economic philosophies. Uh, the, the BJP is expected to be more market friendly, more FDI friendly, probably in terms of more reforms. The Congress is expected to be more welfare driven, subsidy driven, and possibly more pro poor, pro farmers. But if you notice that how Mr. Modi's government has done and how the Congress did, those lines are quite blurred, honestly. Like it's a Congress that privatized, liberalized, and brought in foreign investment in 1991, and the FDI and multi brand retail that the BJP did not allow. But I do believe that both these parties need to become at some stage like the Democrats and Republicans in America or the conservative or the labor in, in the UK. Because I think you need two strong national parties to give India a direction. Now, both these parties are the loggerheads, understandable. But you know, I do believe they both have a vision of this country. How to get there, the route may be different. But I believe a, a buoyant 
BJP and an exuberant Congress is in the interest of the country. You know, um, you just uh, brought some memories back to me on a conversation I had with a friend of mine who happened to be present in the company of PV Narasimha Rao when Narasimha Rao's one of his nephews came to tell him the bad news that BJP was gaining ground. This is in the early 90s. He was still the prime minister at that time. Right. And, and the, the nephew is like on a, a tirade. He's saying these guys have captured this place, that place. I mean, he's coming from the ground and giving him information. And he's saying, uncle, you have to do something about it. He listens to him completely, patiently. He waits for 10 seconds. And he says, they are just as patriotic as us. There's nothing wrong in them ruling this country. See, yeah. so, so you had leaders of that stature. And, and now what is happening is that I mean, you and I share one vision about democracy that you need to have for a thriving democracy two strong parties which can counterbalance each other. And, and yeah. like you correctly observed, if you look at the political spectrum of India today, if you think there's a center line, Congress is a little bit left of center and BJP is a little bit right of center. And, and they are not known. I, I don't buy this right wing, left wing now. We are yeah. only this is what India is today. And it has to be this way. India has yeah. been a capitalist country for donkey's years. For God's sake, don't go and try to do something that is that it is not. But anyway, we've learned from our lessons and we're moving forward. Now, in your opinion, do you think the Congress headquarters or the high command needs your services and why? <laughs> Good one. I think they're the best ones to answer that. But, you know, but Sri, let me tell you that, you know, PV Narasimha Rao, our former prime minister, and I were, you know, we, we are alumni from the Ferguson College in Pune. And I remember, you know, kind of the, 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 the Congress itself, actually. And, I, and I'm sure people from the Congress who watch the program would be very astonished to know because it's a fact that many people in the Congress actually targeted him uh, in, in a great number of ways when he was the prime minister. They felt that he, he actually could have done a lot to stop the Babri Masjid demolition. But people did not realize that P.V. Narasimha Rao was a lot more democratic than people give him credit for. He said, I cannot sack the Uttar Pradesh government of Kalyan Singh because Kalyan Singh has given a written undertaking to the Supreme Court. And I cannot dismiss it under Article 356 on the anticipation that Kalyan Singh is going to probably renege on the promise. And I think this is what is called as, what I would call as democratic leadership. Let's forget what happened thereafter. But I do believe that you know, when I heard about P.V. Narasimha Rao himself being actually forgotten or not being given the respect by the Congress. And I said, here is the man who's the architect of India's reforms. So to answer your question, I remain, you know, a very ordinary individual. I've only always considered myself to be an ideological foot soldier of the party. I don't believe the fact that, you know, just because we become well-known faces because we come on television or because we write blogs and articles, or there are leaders in Latians, Delhi, who have won elections. You know, ultimately, you are a human being. You have as many hours as the other guy has in a day. You are equally vulnerable to the coronavirus. It's good to be grounded and rooted. You know, we are all, we need to be a little honest about our vulnerability. You know, no one is indispensable to an organization. The Congress party can do extraordinarily well without me. It can do very well without anybody currently in the party. And, and I believe the same will stand for the BJP. I remember people used to say that after Mr. Vajpayee, who? And well, there was a hiatus. And then you have Narendra Modi, who wins two elections with an absolute majority, which had never happened before. And people say, who oh, after Modi? I'm sure somebody will emerge. Somebody says, you know, the, the Congress party can't survive with the, without the Gandhis. And I keep saying that. Don't say that. You mock a great party by saying that the great Congress party, which has been in governance for 55 of the 73 years, does not have a leader who can take over? You know, um, you just sparked one other <laughs> thought of mine. I need to say this thing because this is PVN's centenary year, and we need to remember mm -hmm. this great man. Uh, in one of my hangouts <laughs> on PGOs again, uh, when I was talking to Professor M.D. Nalapat, he mentioned that, I think it was late 80s or so, that he had organized a meeting when uh, Nasimara was not in any post. 
he was just basically a party secretary or something like that he had organized a, a meeting for him at his university and and narsimharaji came there came there he gives the speech and he has to stay the night uh, in tiruvananthapuram so mbn is a student he has he takes him to his hostel room inside the hostel room there's only one bed and 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 mbn offers his bed to narsimharaji you know what he said he said no i can sleep on the floor and he would not oh. allow mdn to give up his cot he slept on the floor and within a yeah. few years he was the prime minister of the country look yeah. at the humility of the person forget about everything else that he has accomplished that really you know touched me he said wow and and this family this party did not even give him the proper respect he deserved it's so sad when you when you come across you know these kind of instances anyway i'm sorry to uh, you know no 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 no, no. Sri, Sri, i'm glad you mentioned that because you know right now there's a lot of conversation about how the chinese aggression on eastern ladakh is becoming extremely belligerent and you know it's a big threat to our border but remember that it was narasimha rao as a prime minister in 1993 who struck the border you know peace and tranquility agreement with china which has actually become the shall we say the touchstone of the uh, the border protocols between china and india so you know end of day i do believe that the biggest problem for the congress party is not the bjp is the congress party itself so um you are so eloquent and you are saying that you know a lot of things <laughs> have gone wrong but you yourself you defended the congress party stand whether it was 370 or balakot air strike and and so on and so on. you defended bravely i mean i'm not saying that you may have won those debates or not but you defended them bravely and and now now you are saying that okay i've done all these things i've done whatever you wanted me to do this is basically my definition of a leader is he has to be a first a good follower and in my opinion you did that and now you are trying to lead into a bigger role where you are saying let's introspect and let us try and find out what is wrong and this is the things that i see are wrong then you get shunted out i mean if they are going to develop deaf ears is the gandhi family trying to run this party to the ground into the ground completely what do you think you know sri honestly i think the problem is not just one or two people it's this big congress working committee that has actually failed to deliver uh, this is a body that historically the congress party had elections for then over a period of time it became one where their people were appointed now the moment a leader begins to appoint people to the most powerful working committee of the congress like your cabinet for instance i mean nobody is going to really protest even if your decisions aren't something in the party's interest or because they are short sighted uh, or which can be electorally disastrous so what has happened in the congress party is over a period of time is that as an organization we have atrophied see what i what i have admired about the bjp is even when the chips were down you know there is this robustness to fight the bjp may have been two seats in 1984 but at no point is the moment the shabalu case happened for instance the bjp found the oxygen to see a political space i mean that's what politics is about right i mean yes. the congress finds a space the bjp finds a space there is a contest in the public format and the janta decides who do i want to go with now the fact of the matter is if you look at the congress and i wrote this in an article she i need to share it with your audience the congress has been out of up since over 3 decades out of bihar over 3 decades you look at Ori, uh, odisha since 2000 we haven't come back tamil nadu 1977 so now telangana and andhra seems to have slipped out west bengal 1977 gujarat 1995 madhya pradesh and chatisgarh we were out for 15 years of course madhya pradesh we gave it back as a return gift well wrapped up now this is the point with the congress that unlike the bjp which has this you know spirited combative whether it's leadership or organizational network or cadres or rss support it doesn't matter the fact is that there is that intent to fight back and not to let the government get away with it the congress unfortunately being in power for so long struggles to understand that you lost the public 
has said no to you. Reconcile to that reality and understand that being a good opposition is an equally responsible job. And I'll add one thing, Shri, because you know there will be viewers on your channel from both sides, that if the Congress doesn't do well, I'll tell you what I predict for 2024, and I'm going to predict for the first time on your show. India will see a return to a very you know, fragile coalition politics, where both the Congress and the BJP could actually be significantly weaker. You see, if you don't have competition, the BJP could become arrogant, could become extremely you know, indifferent, could actually take steps which are highly unilateral, and you know, ultimately, the people can be very unforgiving. They can just dump you overnight. We came down from 206 to 44. Rajiv Gandhi's government came down from 404 to 197. It can happen to Mr. Modi in 2024. So I'm just saying that if you don't have a robust opposition, it's bad news for the Congress, of course, because then it's an existential crisis. But it's also not good news for the BJP. Therefore, I do hope that both these parties have aggressive ideological battles on on healthcare, if we debate climate change, we talk about, you know, maybe even sensitive issues like Article 370 and Ram Mandir, you can debate what you like. But the two parties need to understand that the country needs to see ideas and practices and philosophies and dreams of India that both these parties need to espouse and then obviously walk the talk on. Um, that was very uh, erudite and um, brilliant. Now, I, I, I will ask you a simple question. See, your metrics for the party is perform or perish. Essentially, yeah. you have to show what you have done and, and, and you have to run on your record. And this is a very simple requirement for any politician. Having climbed the rungs, the ladder, and now you are coming up and saying that you need to make me the leader. What have you done for that? Now, in if you use this metric, do you think the the Gandhi family will measure up to it? Well, I mean, it, it, the sum and substance is pretty straightforward that we haven't done well in 2014 and 19. And I come from the school of thought that the buck stops at the top. So to answer your question, if I was the Congress president in either 14 or 19, I would take responsibility and tell somebody that, you know what, somebody else should get an opportunity to lead the party. There is no denying that the Gandhi's contribution to the growth of the Congress has been phenomenal. Yes, we did win 2004, we won 2009, and we all know that you know Mrs. Gandhi was highly successful for a long time. And then, of course, there were errors like the emergency, which was a terrible aberration. Uh, Pandit Nehru had a great run, uh, ended up with you know there was the whole disappointment of the China war. But end of day, these things happen in politics. You're going to have successes, you're going to have failures. That's all right. You're going to win some, you're going to lose some. But I do want to answer your question that end of day, I'm glad that Mr. Gandhi took up the you know big moral responsibility for the 2019 defeat and resigned. And he actually publicly stated something that I admire him for and appreciate that I'm not coming back and nobody from the Gandhi family will now become the Congress president, which is why I have been, you know, actually, I need to tell you, I joined the Congress because of the Gandhi family, because I met them in a very remarkable situation pre-2004 election. And I am myself vocal enough to say that the Congress party has talent. And I'm sure if somebody gets the space and the opportunity and the backing of all, you know, people rise to an occasion. Many people are skeptical about X, Y, Z, but believe me, people do deliver. Give them the hello, give them the position. They do rise to the occasion. So I, to answer your question, if, if the Gandhis have decided not to take the lead, it needs to be now formalized that a non-Gandhi leader within the Congress will take it forward. It'll be good for the Congress. It'll be good for Indian democracy. Um, I'm just going to try and see if you can paint us the inside war room of what happens in the Congress party. See, you've been called a rumor monger for a few few months at least, and before you know, then you got suspended. And and the Congress party typically seems to have a fair amount of cooks. Now, there is a saying, right? Too many cooks spoil the broth. I'm not saying that's what happened in the 2019, but perhaps you can share a little bit about the process of decision making that happens in this party today. Well, I'll give you one example and that will tell you why the Congress party needs an absolutely dramatic, drastic organizational renewal or overhaul. Uh, say there is an MLA election happening in Maharashtra. Okay, there were elections that happened last October, November. 
uh, for the state, for the state assembly. I could not fathom for the life of me, Shri, as to why is an MLA ticket being given in, say, Ghatkopar or in Nanded or Nasik, Pune, Abhinagar, Aurangabad, why does it have to go to Delhi? I mean, to my mind, you need to decentralize and go ahead and empower your state leadership. Let them take the call. Why do people from Delhi need to be at all involved? Well, who is going to be your candidate in Borivali, for instance? You don't even know him. But there are people sitting out there. You know, everybody wants power and to be the decision maker, to be the influencer for whatever reasons. And this has cost the Congress party dear. You know, like, for example, we use this term very often in business, regulatory cholesterol, right? The Congress party has got very clogged arteries. Things don't flow. I mean, you know, there is too much of fat out there that needs to burn. And honestly, these are decisions that actually have to be taken by your independent state leaders. But I do believe one thing, Shri. Empowerment is never given. you got to take the empowerment, even in the corporate world. You know, if you're going to wait for your boss to give you the freedom to operate, keep waiting. He's going to give you a knock on the head for saying you never met your targets. But if you go and tell him, excuse me, you want me to get my goals? I need to take my own call on the nature of the deal, the clients I want to talk to, the negotiation on price, leave that to me. And your boss, frankly speaking, will have no choice. So I believe the Congress party needs to do that. And therefore, the G23, as this whole group has been branded, is saying exactly the same thing. Change. Because if you don't, the only other alternative is extinction. So the can you just maybe give like the top five uh line point line items that the g23 is expecting and are these within the framework of the party constitution all of it is possible within the framework of the constitution and as they say if there's a will there's a way uh, for example one is hold elections to the post of the congress president two hold elections to the congress working committee three Look at how you are going to make the youth vote your focus going forward. The Congress Party has completely alienated itself, particularly from the urban middle class youth. This used to be, by the way, the Congress's uh, formidable bastion once upon a time. We've just given it away. Number four, we have talked about the fact that you need to decentralize the entire AICC structure and ensure that from the block to the state level, there are empowered leaders. And among the other suggestions that have been given are, you know, create not just one Congress president running the party, but you can actually have four vice presidents for different regions who are supporting the Congress president. So they also become potential presidents of the future. And as the, as the letter clearly says, strengthen internal democracy, because if, I, I'm telling you, in a company, you know, I remember when I joined Grindley's, there were 20 uh, MBAs from I'm Ahmedabad, XLRI, I'm Bangalore, I'm Kolkata, blah, blah. I'm sure everybody wanted to be the MD of Grindley's Bank or wanted to be the chief investment officer. Now, you cannot say that only three of you can become and the 17 of you will never become, no matter how well you perform. And I think India has become an aspirational country. India has become a country where people believe anything is possible. Uh, Mr. Modi becoming prime minister from his humble beginnings as whose father was, you know, one of those tea vendors at that point of time. It's, a, it's an extraordinary story. You can't take it away from Mr. Modi. I've been a critic of Mr. Modi's uh, politics and ideology. But I do believe that that's a remarkable uh, success story when only hard work took him to where it is. So I do believe that the Congress needs to create this culture of meritocracy in the party because that will really unleash the talent, you know, which is waiting to explode, that we need to give them space. If you do that, anything is possible. Uh, I know you probably were not present at this meeting, but when the G23 posed these questions, what did the Gandhi family have to say to that? Well, I, I, I was not the fly on the wall, you're right, uh, but I happened to be probably the flying mosquito in the next room. So what <laughs> I gathered <laughs> what I gathered from sources, to use the term, 
is that you know people who are around the key decision makers in this case the C main people in the cwc or even the congress's interim president many of them actually are just uh, you know obsequious people who try and just back a faction because they believe that's the only way they can prove their political worth this is one of the weaknesses of the congress party you know what you call as a chumcha culture that many people are just going prostrate and you know saying you are everything and without you there will be no sunrise tomorrow morning i mean this is the bane of the congress party frankly you know shri you know you are you so experienced yourself that in, in my company or in your organization if 15 people came and said listen we believe there's a problem this is how we can you know take more business from city bank this is how we can do better in cards this is how we need to probably look at our credit default swaps this is how we need to probably look at a country risk i will invite everybody to come and say please tell me i'm dying to hear what you have to say here the response was are you violating party discipline kumari selja was a very senior leader has the eyes and ears of the congress high command she called the g23 as bjp moles as traitors can you call gulam nabi azad anand sharma kapil sibal sashi tharoor manish tiwari malin devra jitin prasad raj babbar can you call them bjp stooges so supposing if someone gives you a constructive feedback you'll call them that they are working as moles as a trojan horses i mean i was told by the bjp spokesperson oh, sorry the congress spokesperson that i am actually fronting a bjp conspiracy within the congress i mean it's ridiculous it's so absolutely phantasmagoric is 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 i don't know i'm speechless you know sanjay set aside the internal dissension wasn't the defeat of rahul gandhi in 2019 at amethi a, a loud and clear message that the people have turned away from the family well we can't ignore the fact that amethi was literally like you know the backyard it's like your uh, you know it's like your uh, the garden in front of your home you just strolled in and it was yours and if you look at the history of the congress leaders uh, everybody has been represented there at some point or the other uh, from the gandhi family so it was a stunning surprise and in retrospect i'm glad mr gandhi actually fought from wayanad as well probably he could see the straws in the wind but i do believe that that is a terrible setback it tells you that you know even the most formidable leader in the congress party could not have the sixth sense to gauge that the public mood had changed and i think this is why i believe democracies are always you know so unpredictable and therefore a humongous challenge if you're disconnected from the ground level uh, you know ultimately the chickens do come home to roost now if you look at the people who are in g23 one name that is uh, that comes to my mind just jumps out is gulam nabi azad because he has been with the government he has been close to indira gandhi then rahul rajiv gandhi then no i'm sorry sanjay gandhi indira gandhi rajiv gandhi yeah. and, and 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 sonia gandhi and now i am hearing that he may no longer be the uh, head of the congress party in rajya sabha now is he sort of like the person who is uh, the voice of the g23 what are your thoughts on that well i think the g23 is uh, frankly a very collective uh, forum uh, she let me share this with you that sure. these con these conversations have been happening for a while and uh, obviously mr azad is an extremely senior stalwart of the party and he is equally i would say shepherding the entire effort to bring about reformation within the congress but i feel that in this case uh, mr anand sharma uh, kapil sibal uh, sashi tharoor manish all these people have been putting their heads together for a while and i do hope that better sense will prevail because you know i have been also hearing rumors that um, mr azad will be marginalized if you have read uh, recently in uttar pradesh some of our leaders like rp n singh jitin prasad uh, raj babbar who are part of the g23 
have not been given any role in the new restructured Congress in Uttar Pradesh. I feel these are very petty uh, vindictiveness. Should not happen because this means that you are refusing to acknowledge the fact that here are 23 people who have spoken up in the interest of the party. If anybody says that the letter was leaked to the press, well, I want to say find out who leaked it. And number two, assuming that it was leaked by a party X or party Y, isn't it a manifestation of despair that people have to go to the media to be heard? And I think these are the internal challenges for the Congress party. And I want to mention two instances here. Please. This is a, this is a party, Shri, where Pandit Nehru used to write letters to himself anonymously in the leading newspaper, writing a letter to himself, articles to himself saying, Dear Prime Minister, please do not believe that you are the be all and end all. Don't become autocratic and authoritarian. Listen to the voices within your party and the public. He used to warn himself because the Congress at that point was unassailable. This is the same party where Firoz Gandhi, where Firoz Gandhi took on his own father-in-law, Pandit Nehru, on corruption charges against his government, on the then finance minister, Mr. T. Krishnamachari. And T. Krishnamachari had to resign. Mr. Nehru's own son-in-law, a Congress member, was taking on the prime minister on the floor of parliament. The Congress has actually been an epitome of this kind of liberalism. Therefore, you know, for me to get suspended, forget me, I, um, I don't consider my, myself as the big example of what, what the Congress's fault lines are. But to bracket everybody as a rebel, as a traitor, as a BJP mole, I think that's frankly absurd. I was, uh, I was going to say that somebody as senior as Kapil Sibyl, who actually frequently stuck his neck out. Guys, mm. these are all facts, okay? Whatever I'm talking today about these personalities, these are all facts. He, he dared to go to the United Kingdom and hold a press conference on the eve of the elections in 2019. I mean, he has done so much for the party. How would somebody just say, this guy is a BJP Dalal? I mean, it's it's shocking. I mean, I may not agree with Kapil Sibyl on a lot of things. I don't think he is a BJP Dalal. That is, for me, it's, it's stunning. What are your thoughts on this? Well, you know, all I can say is that no namak harams in G23. They're all namak halals. You know, end of day, everybody's an honest person. I think everybody cares. Everybody is a big believer in the fact that the Congress party is a party with a good future. It has got a historical contribution to India, that the Congress party can have a blueprint for the country, both economic and political. You know, Sri, if you look at India today, um, the GDP uh, in the last quarter is down by 23.9%. Uh, they have done the worst in the G20 countries, also amongst the emerging markets. If you look at, for example, uh, you know, the issue of the pandemic. India is now number two in number of cases after after United States. We overtaken Brazil. And India, and truly, we have got both our feet on two banana peels. Mr. Modi's government is frankly, at this point of time, struggling because it's a catch-22. If the economy doesn't improve, you know, you have a serious problem. If the pandemic doesn't go down, you're not going to see consumer demand go up or private investment happen. And Therefore, the Congress party has an alternative blueprint, I'm sure is a, is a party that has the talent to create what I would call as a plan B for India. And therefore, when leaders like Kapil Sibyl and Manish Tiwari and, you know, as you rightly mentioned, Sashi Tharoor, if they are not being heard, then I think the Congress party is committing political harakiri. And I'm sure everybody will be astonished that why won't you hear your best voices? You know, uh, you again, you are segueing me to my next question. This is an incredible conversation because I'm like just getting ready to ask my question. And there you go. You lead me up to it. So <laughs> there, in my opinion, sir, the G23 represents about 95% of the intellectual quotient of the party. And, and who do you think orchestrated this meeting where this Dalali name was called? Was it Mr. Ahmed Patel? He's supposed to be the political secretary of uh, Sonia Gandhi. Well, you know, I can tell you that there are certain that this is the problem with the Congress. I mean, historically, it has created this culture of a poetry or a cabal. And I'm surprised that the leaders, even in subsequent generations, are not able to understand that 
because we are such a large diversified complex party with a you know deep penetration all over india you need to listen to more voices i do understand shri that if you and i were for example running a party or running a company together we may have certain favorites but it doesn't mean that you listen to your favorites alone i can understand that you know the president or the you know the former congress president uh, will have certain people whose wisdom they rely on or intellect and so on but it does not mean that you don't listen to natural voices the media intellectuals listen to the, even the opposition i always believe listen to the opposition your biggest learning happens from listening to what the opposition is saying so i think you know i think we have gone insular chosen to not listen to the bad news uh, we are encouraging a culture of cowtowing where you know even everyone says that yeah the, the sun is shining bright and everyone says yeah the sun is shining bright when it may be actually sunset time then we are actually becoming in my opinion slaves uh, to to individuals and personalities instead of to the ideology of the party the guiding principle has to be the ideology of the party or its practices or its programs you can't say that if one individual is not there i'm not going to be in the party then what's your ideology all about so true now um one other uh, guest on our show had mentioned that ahmed patel and gulam nabi azad don't get along very well looks like now that has come out and played out in the open uh, what are your thoughts on that you know in politics uh, you know there there, is, there there are people who have been together for a long time you know you have your ups you have your downs i'm not going to comment on their personal chemistry but one of the reasons why the congress working committee uh, could not elect or select a leader after mr gandhi resigned was because you know they could not collectively coalesce as to who the leader should be now you have the congress working committee that has been told by mr gandhi that please select a leader and now it's more than a year plus they haven't chosen a leader in fact mrs sonia gandhi has become the becoming the interim president all over again i'm sure the people of india are wondering why is the congress party not hungry you know forget the fact that elections have happened we have done well in a few and blah blah there's a bihar election coming up in november it's not just about elections it's about the fact that a, a opposition party has a role to play now one of the suggestions i had given was form a shadow cabinet let's say you have mr chidambaram as a finance minister as your shadow cabinet finance minister say dr shashi tharoor as your external affairs minister maybe anand sharma as your home minister maybe mr kapil sibal is a defense minister now you know you would have people who talk to the government and to the media and the public and keep everyone well informed and keep the government on its toes now these are all opportunities that the congress party is not exercising and trust me no one is holding us back okay shri you don't require one year to do this if the congress party decides today to have a congress president in 3 months we'll have one it's not such a you know rocket science that we can't have it we can change overnight it's a question of will power sanjay if you look back at the history of the congress party every time indira gandhi found that her position was a little vulnerable she would split the party and she would take the my way or the highway attitude you take a split in 60 i think 69 and then and many such things happened every electoral defeat of hers or even a reverse that would lead to her splitting up the party and she kept saying that my i am the brand of congress and in fact there was a sycophant who said indira is india and uh, so so that kept going now with the 23 out of the way i'm just just you know saying that perhaps there is no rehabilitation of there is no reconciliation i'm just saying this right who sure. do you see as a young leadership emerge out of congress because even the one guy who seemed promising sachin pilot he just raised a rebel uh, a banner of revolt and he has been sort of samjao fight and bujao fight but you know who else do you see emerging as a leadership in congress but yeah you know it's interesting that you mentioned mr devkant barwa you know he was the one who said india is indira and indira is india right. and after a defeat in 1990 1977 he became one of our most hostile critics now politics is extremely weird honestly it's very weird and for someone who came into this laterally i can tell you this is one um, shall we say practice where it's very difficult for people to trust each other this is 
a deeply unfortunate reality of politics. But yeah, I mean, uh, I remember until he left, Jyoti Raditya Sindhya and Sachin Pilot were two names along with Sashi Tharoor that I used to hear a lot from urban India and from a lot of Congress party workers as future leaders of the Congress or even potential prime ministers. I also feel, for example, that when you look at the other leaders in the Congress, one of the, one of the people who was talked about earlier was Mukul Vasnik, who's had a phenomenal career in the Congress, but has kept a low profile over the last, since he lost the last Lok Sabha election. You have, you have people. It's not that you don't have talent. You have a young talent coming up in Dipender Huda in Haryana. One of the most underrated talent in the Congress party, and I really say it because I know him very well, is Milind Debra. Very hardworking, extremely intelligent and nuanced, uh, but I don't think many people know where he comes from. Manish is aggressive, belligerent, and you know one of the more articulate voices of the party. And you know, frankly, when you look at a veteran like Anand Sharma, Gulam Nabi Azad, Kapil Sibyl, if you give anybody an opportunity amongst this mix, anybody can really rise up and take it. A lot of people in the Congress party have talked of Captain Amrinder Singh as, as somebody who, you know, who should possibly consider that option. Of course, he's, he said that after his Punjab stint, he doesn't want to be in active politics anymore. People have got good things to say about Bhupesh Baghel, the way he's doing Chhattisgarh. So I do believe that you will get the talent. You know, I come from the school of thought that the moment somebody gets a chance, the story changes. For example, now in the US Open with no Nadal, Federer, and now not even Djokovic, some young guy is going to win the US Open by Sunday. And trust me, he is not going to be the same guy thereafter. He'll be a threat in every Grand Slam to the big three. Because the whole perspective changes. So I do believe Rajiv Gandhi had no political experience when he became prime minister. And until, you know, there were, until he floundered in the last couple of years, when things went completely haywire in the initial part, he had a great run. So, you know, if you give somebody a chance, anything can happen. So um, this is a tricky question. Uh, who is running the party now? And please don't tell me that it is Sonia Gandhi or uh, Rahul Gandhi. We know they do not because one is not very well health wise. The other one doesn't seem interested. So who really is running the party today? Well, you know, since I'm suspended, I'm not privy to that, but I can say this much for a fact that uh, there are rumors to the effect that uh, that Mr. Gandhi may come back, or the fact, fact is that he's taking most of the critical decisions as of now. I mean, this is what I've heard. I see. Um, so we, we are now almost at the end of our uh, banter here, conversation here. So I think uh, I'd start, like to start taking some questions from our public. Sure. And, sure. and, and uh, I, I want to tell something to our viewers. Viewers, P Gurus doesn't hold a, a brief for any party. What P Gurus wants is proper news, uh, give a platform for people to express themselves, like the way I did with Sanjay Jha. If, if you had listened to Sanjay Jha <laughs> in, in TV Hangout, at the most, you might get two minutes. Two minutes is like a bonus. You get one minute, sometimes less than that. Right. So, so the point of having a P Guru's conversation is to try and allow the person to express that uh, their viewpoint, finish their thoughts, you know, complete the whole evolution. You get to understand the person better. So I think in that respect, I'm very happy you join, you, you know, decided to come on our uh, uh, channel, uh, Sanjay, and I'm hoping to get more such Congress voices also, because at the end of the day, democracy has to win. And for a country of 136 crores and growing in Australia every day, you really yeah. need that. You need that. There is no yeah. way around this thing. So with your yeah, permission, yeah. let's take a yeah. quick look at some of the questions here. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Kunal Malhotra wants to know, is there a shortage of cadres in Congress in most states? The short answer to that is yes, we don't have a cadre structure, but Congress has a, a, an organizational structure for sure. Now, one of the ideas that you know we believe we need to work on is like the BJP, for instance, is develop those cadres. I think the time has come where you know we used to historically say we are you know very liberal and you know, volunteers come and support the Congress. But if you have a cadre that gives you a more disciplined uh, penetration at the grassroots level. So the answer to that is, well, the Congress party has been like a movement, but it may not be a bad idea, especially after two 
dismal routes in the hands of the BJP for the Congress to actually develop a cadre. And I think a lot of people in the party believe that's a way forward. Uh, Arjun Kulkarni wants to know who all are the old guard that does not want uh, that does not want to allow Congress to restructure itself. Well, I would say that the G23 are those who want change, and the rest are those who are no changers. This is a good question from somebody called Chidam. <laughs> I don't know whether why he doesn't want to finish it. Um, how do you rate Congress's chances in 2024? Does Congress stand a chance of putting up a good show? See, good question. See, uh, there, there's an old maxim or an uh, aphorism that says that uh, a week is a long time in politics. Uh, this is you're talking four years. And I, you know, I just tell you, Chidam, that I remember in 2011 12 when the Congress was getting decimated by those Anna Hazare and Arvind Kejriwal agitation. Even then, the survey said that the Congress is going to come back if there's a general election. And the BGP was nowhere in the reckoning. I still believe that if Mr. Modi was not the prime ministerial candidate for the BJP, the Congress could have probably done neck to neck with BJP in 2014. So things do change. And I'm, I do believe that if the Congress were to get its act together, let's say in the next six months, even one year, let's hope in one year, it's for the party to then paint its alternative blueprint for India. I would like you to, even if the Congress party lost the election, please read this manifesto. It's a brilliant piece of work, brilliant piece of work. But the problem with the Congress party is it needs to win elections. And I do believe that things can change. Maybe a new leader, a more hungry party, and a party that actually offers an alternative that the people of India are very appetized by or attracted by. And you have a contest. Anything can happen. So the short answer to you is yes. So um, Aditya Rane has two good questions. And if you will permit me, let's give him two questions because this is a good question. Sure. First question sure. is, what's up with Congress getting support from CCP? No, no let me tell you, please don't uh, fall for all that. Uh, you know, something that you mentioned, Sri, at the very beginning. I actually told my own party, please do not attack Mr. Modi for saying that he will allow Indian territory to go into the hands of the Chinese. Uh, similarly, I also said that please do not attack the Congress for being soft on terror or you know all this pro-China, pro-Pakistan. It's all rubbish. I think all of us are patriotic. All of us are nationalistic. All of us are going to fight tooth and nail for our country, not just as you know spectators in a cricket stadium, but also as as citizens for our democracy. I like. I do believe that end of day, nobody in India, nobody in India wants to see our soldiers die. I mean, this is a given. So my short answer is, please, I mean, these are all political propaganda points. Don't get into it. My party should never criticize the BJP for, you know, kind of allowing a foreign policy collapsing in such a way that India's uh, interests are compromised on national security. And I think that acquisition of the Congress is equally, in my opinion, uh, you know, fairly fragile. So uh, Aditya has a second question for you. How does Sanjay feel when Manmohan Singh said that Muslims have first right over nation's resources. Well, I'll tell you what he actually said. You know, this is because as a spokesperson, this used to come up pretty often. So I'll tell you, actually in that document, it didn't say Muslims alone. You know what that document said? And I know vaguely the words. That document, Sri, said that all the resources of India should be given to our scheduled castes, our scheduled tribes, our Dalits, our marginalized and the Muslims and the minorities. So it was not about Muslims alone. Basically, I'll tell you where, where we all need to agree. Okay, I'm a very proud Hindu, by the way. I'm a very proud Hindu. I'm a, you know, as they say, the good old traditional Mithila Brahman from, from Bihar. I'm a, I'm, I, I go to temples. I have a mini temple at home. But I want to tell you this. I do believe, I do believe that all of us need to kind of be very proud of, you know, saying this. And saying so with pride that in our country, you know, we can live in great social harmony with wonderful peace and really respecting our secular diversity. You know, it's like the reason why I feel America is such a great country, Sri. You know, it's it's a place where it's, it's a land of dreams. Anything is possible, whether you are an Italian, whether you're a Greek or whether you come from an African country. And definitely Silicon Valley is a success story that Sri, you are a manifestation of. So I do believe that we need to recognize that and, you know, end of day, 
the truth be said, we, we are big believers in a democracy that frankly can carry each and every one without any conflict at all. Thanks for that uh, explanation. Um, I'm sure uh, many people ignored all the other things and just picked on one word. And this is this is exactly what you you will expect somebody trying to get something out of nothing would do. Renal wants to know: Do you think the BJP <clears throat> will go down the same road in the future as the Congress? In fact, that is framing the whole reason we are having this debate. We want a healthy democracy. We don't want, you know. Please go ahead. No, actually, I, I mentioned it earlier in the program that if you don't have a strong opposition, uh, at some point it is going to impact even the BJP because uh, political arrogance is bound to seep in at some point. It's already there in a great number of ways. Uh, if, let's do a very dispassionate assessment of where the Modi government has performed and you'll realize that on the economy has been dismal, on the pandemic, absolutely substandard. India is facing 90,000 cases a day. Uh, you have a, a very disturbed communal temperature in this country from time to time. That's also a sporadic disturbance that we can do without. Uh, you have a situation at the border with China. You have a risk of a two-front war with Pakistan that even the generals are talking about. Uh, Indian democracy is being questioned because of the fear of you know, criticizing the government and being called anti-national. These are not signs of a very what I call is a very dynamic government. This is a sign of a dysfunctional government. So will the Congress come back? I think it's hugely possible. And if the Congress party doesn't do well, I actually worry for the BJP itself. Um, again, your answer segues into the next question. Totally random. Manav Bhatt wants to know, have you considered creating a new Congress party? You know, I do believe that, uh, you know, the splits have already happened in the party. I think G23 believes that the Congress party has to internally strengthen itself. Um, you know, it's like, hey, you need to build muscle. Uh, you're not going to get more muscle by just getting into another gym membership. So you need to build muscle, build muscle. That's it. Plain and simple. you got to perk up, have your protein shakes, hit the treadmill and lift those, lift those dumbbells. Becoming a member of multiple gyms is not really going to build those muscles for you. So no split, we have to do it from within. Uh, that's a great answer, by the way, Sanjay. Um, Sachin Sharma wants to know, what is so wrong with Modi's ideology, not looking to minority appeasement, being a proud Hindu, and also fulfilling <laughs> some of the things that were promised in their manifesto? Well, I can tell you one thing that, you know, it is there is nothing wrong in, in being proud of the religion that you are part of. All that, you know, I oppose the ideology of the BJP for only one reason, that it tends to exclude the minorities. And there are, you know, cosmetic, shall we say, feel-good statements made from time to time. But, you know, there are so many leaders who are so critical of the minorities. This is not healthy for our democracy. And I think we got to realize that India's uniqueness is our secular diversity. You know, we have become a fascinating story of the world because we live in peace and harmony. Now, in every religion, there are some hardliners. Let's not dictate the entire country's future by a few inflammatory voices or some strident philosophers who are spreading a little hate in the system. I do believe that end of day, uh, you know, we, we have to recognize this truth. That is forget about the fact that secular Hindu isn't the constitution. You look at the fact that today in India, the Congress has been blamed for minority appeasement. And perhaps there have been times in the past where we have politically perhaps not handled it in the way we should have. I agree with that. But that does not mean that today somebody should allow a lynching of a minority member to happen. Does it mean that today when whether it's a Christian, whether it's a Muslim, whether it's any other minority community member, if somebody is attacked or hurt to the place of worship, it's our job to protect it. And, you know, Sri, I keep coming back to this point that as we are the majority community in this country. And I believe it is our responsibility, actually, to make sure that those who are minorities, whoever they are, are feeling safe and protected and get an equal space. Just like why the Indians, you know, the Indian immigrants in America are, a, are something that all of us are so proud of back home. Why? 
not just because of the billions and the heads of Google and Microsofts of the world, but because you have done it being a small member in a large country, right? And I believe that's what is what we need to practice at all times. So I think I do believe that we have a right to our religion. I, I'll say that to you again. I'm a very proud Hindu. But Hinduism has taught me something to be eclectic. I do believe Hinduism has taught me fraternity, love, tolerance, forgiveness, oneness. And, and I think that's what Swami Vivekananda said, actually. You know, I do believe that we all need to go back to our history, read the right scripts and tell ourselves that at no point has our religion told ourselves to exclude anybody. And therefore, I want to answer and I want to take this question, as they say, the bull by the horns, that we need to be, we need to assimilate. We need an amalgamation within, not exclusionary. Let's become inclusionary. And uh, I would like to end this uh, conversation with another quote from Sri P. V. Narasimha Rao. And this is his 100th century year. And, yeah. and he is supposed to have quoted, if you want to run a government, you need a majority. But if you want to run the country, you need to take everyone along. Sanjay, yeah. thank you very much. You've answered every question of mine. And, and all the best to you and all the best to your party. Namaskar. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for inviting me.